Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us on the sky. Hello YouTube and welcome to my channel. Most of you are probably aware that a number of celebrities recently released a video of themselves singing John Lennon's Imagine. This is actually quite providential because it gives us an opportunity to talk about this song and why it's so wrong. Now, if somehow you've never heard the original song before, I recommend listening to it and reading the lyrics, particularly the first two verses, before proceeding with this video. Now, the surface level analysis would probably be to consider this song to be an idealistic, if not naive, aspiration of Lenin that affirms basic moral truths. War should be avoided, greed and hunger should be stamped out, and men should live in brotherhood with each other. It doesn't seem like this song should really be that objectionable, except perhaps on musical value, where of course there are differences of opinion. However, it's very clear that a lot of people do object to it, not just on musical grounds, but for the message it expresses. But if there are so many think pieces about why this song is terrible, what could I possibly add to this discussion? Well, reading a lot of these think pieces, I notice that they all object to the song for similar reasons, and that they are all wrong. In this video, I will show how the usual critique of John Lennon's Imagine is insufficient, using Sargon of Akkad and Ben Shapiro as representatives for this kind of view. I will present a counter critique represented by Big Joel's critique of Ben Shapiro. And finally, I will show why a deeper fundamental critique using the analyses of late 20th century Italian philosopher Augusto del Noce overcomes Big jo Joel's objections and shows why the message of Imagine is not just bad, but in fact self-contradicting. So let's begin with Ben Shapiro's critique. Like, in the first moments of Imagine, Lenin talks about all the people in the world living for today, and that just sets Ben off. What he just said is the most immoral thing you could possibly say. <laughs> imagine all the people living for today. That's basically what we have. Okay, imagine all the people living for today it means you don't plan for the future. It means you don't care about your kids. It means you don't care what happens tomorrow. It means you don't care about anybody else. You just care about you. Okay, this is the most selfish morality possible. If all the people lived just for today, they would screw everything in sight and kill all their enemies. It's a simple point. Shapiro says that living for today, instead of creating peace and harmony, would create economic and socio-political instability due to short-sightedness and bad foreplanning. This is essentially the same argument Sargon of Akkad makes. A, I hate, I hate the way that that begins. I hate this, this conception. Right? We don't need to imagine that all that is around us that is what's around us. It's clearly obvious. But imagine all the people living for today. That sounds deeply irresponsible, doesn't it? Because, I mean, sometimes you have natural disasters and other catastrophes that happen that are preventable with some sort of forward planning, and for that you have to live for the future. You have to understand that something's coming, but again... It's hard to come up with something to say about this because it's just so incredibly and self-evidently ridiculous. Lenin isn't referring to today like these 24 hours, right? The stanza is about imagining if people didn't believe in an afterlife. In that case, they wouldn't count on and organize their lives around some unprovable reward, and would instead work to make the world a better place right now, like today, for instance. Big Joel's rebuttal may sound simple, but it's going to be the springboard which launches us into a very complex discussion, so I want to make sure we're set up for success and investigate this argument thoroughly. Essentially, Sargon of Akkad and Ben Shapiro are opposing two values, living for today against planning for the future, and telling us living for today is bad because it is contrary to planning for the future, which is good. Against this, Big Joel is saying, when John Lennon says living for today, he means today in a broader sense, as in living for this world, as opposed to living for an afterlife. Big Joel is essentially saying, I agree with Shapiro that living for today is bad when it is opposed to planning for the future, but that's not what Lenin means. If Shapiro only understood what Lenin means, that living for the secular world is better than living for religious afterlife, surely he would agree. And Big Joel would have reason to think that. In a talk with Michael Sherman, Ben Shapiro said the following in two different clips. What I do know, and the reason why I'm religious, is that a religious lifestyle that, that is based on certain fundamental premises, I think, makes life better for people. I think that the, the rules that are set down, yeah. uh, as currently understood at least, uh, are rules that, that are likely to lead you to leading a happier and better life than, than your pure reason alone. Because pure reason alone unleashed uh, without even those moorings in Judeo-Christianity can lead to a lot of really terrible places. 
okay, so you take a bunch of stuff that you hate during life and you're going to hate it your whole life and then you're going to die and everything's going to get fixed in heaven. I actually don't think that's a very good way to teach religion, number one. Right. And number two, I don't right. think that's what religion is here that's right. to do. Right. I, think that, right. I think that religion is here to better your life here on earth. And then if you believe in an afterlife, if you believe that there is a rectification of the, of the wrongs that you experienced at the hands of others, you were, a, you were a baby who was killed by the Nazis and now there's an afterlife where you're going to live right. on, that's a, that's a different question slightly than what religion provides to most people. So although Big Joel and Ben Shapiro appear to disagree because they are using words to mean different things, once you remove the difference in semantics, you realize that they are very much on the same side here. The side that says, live your life for secular success, don't count on something beyond it. Sargon's content is too spread out to find a good clip, but given his well-known atheist views, it's not unreasonable to conclude that he would also take this side. Now obviously, they would have vast differences of belief in how one should live for this world, but they all agree with John Lennon in the limited sense of, live for this world, worry not for the next. Essentially, the good, both for the individual and for the collective, can be grounded in earthly goods, without reference to a transcendent god. This gives us a few questions to investigate. 1. What is the philosophical tradition between Ben Shapiro, Big Joel, Sargon, and John Lennon? Essentially, why do such diverse people have such similar views? Is it because this is the obvious and correct view that everyone should agree with, or is there an equally if not more valid alternative? 2. Are there any fundamental internal problems with this tradition? And three, can examining this tradition help us understand the problems for, of today? For example, can it explain the collapse of Marxism and why Western democracies are now suffering from the same internal collapse? The thinker who will help us best understand these questions is late 20th century philosopher Augusto del Noche. Augusto del Noche began his career writing against fascism, but as he watched many of his contemporaries seek a bridge between Christianity and Marxism, del Noche became concerned about the rise of Christian Marxism. The work I'll be referencing today, The Crisis of Modernity, is a synthesis of much of his thought, and it will serve as a springboard for us to understand why John Lennon, Ben Shapiro, Sargon, and Big Joel all came to the same conclusion, and why that conclusion is dangerous and wrong. Del Noche begins by answering the question, what is modernity? Now, modern comes from Latin, meaning now or today. But when we turn it into a noun or join it to a word like philosophy, Del Noche argues that we are making an axiological claim, that the modern has superseded what has come before, and that today it is no longer possible to think or do otherwise. But the question arises, what is no longer possible? Del Noche answers his question with spiritual transcendence. In the medieval era, Christian thought was harmonized with Greek thought to produce a cosmology where the imminent world had meaning and reference to the transcendent. It is a vertically oriented cosmology. The modern world, however, introduced scientism and skepticism of anything transcendent. It saw itself as clearing away the old myths and anything that can't be scientifically proved. Therefore, the supernatural had to be rejected. Transcendence, therefore, became horizontally oriented through linear time. Transcendence does not refer to man's relation to God or mankind's relation to God, but man or mankind's relation to himself as he changes through time. What takes the place of heaven or the beatific vision is a vision of the transcendent future. The cross is no longer the defining moment in time, it is the ephemeral line between the superstitious past and the scientific future. And here we see this connection between John Lennon and our internet edgelords. Despite their disagreements, they share the idea that what matters is the material world and how human beings can order it, either by living for today or planning for the future. What doesn't matter, and what we'll see is not allowed to matter, is the idea of spiritual transcendence. That is to say, John Lennon and Big Joel might be socialists, and Sargon of Akkad and Ben Shapiro may be liberals or even conservatives depending on who you ask, but they are all modernists. Now, to understand further the rejection of religion, we must consider the relationship between modernism and Gnosticism. In its manifestation in linear time, modernism represents a clean break with medieval thought. However, in its relationship to enlightenment and rejection of illusion, modernism can be seen as a continuation of Gnostic thought. This is further seen in Francis Bacon's scientific philosophy and Hegel's dialectics, and understanding them as a rejection of the divine law and respect for authority. Del Noche's understanding of authority and respect depends upon a Thomistic understanding of being and becoming. Put simply, a child is becoming an adult and so has a natural duty to obey his parents who already is an adult. Natural authority, therefore, is the relationship between being and becoming. How this corresponds to a 
Christian cosmology is clear when God is understood as being itself, and the source of being and everything else. To gain knowledge meant to understand the order of the world, and by understanding it, participate in it and transcend through it. This changed during the Enlightenment. Already by Francis Bacon, you have scientists who don't merely want to understand nature, but who want to vex and torture it. That is, seek to gain power over the natural order. This carries through the Enlightenment into Hegel. Hegel's dialectics, like the scientists torturing nature for power over her, also reject the natural order in favor of man-made creation. The given thesis and antithesis are rejected in favor of a created synthesis. The denial of what is given in favor of the created gives to man that which in the medieval era was only attributed to God, the power of creation. If creation is not the cause of a divinely ordered universe but a power of man, then man can create goodness from violence against the natural order. And it is from this understanding that the violence and totalitarianism of the 20th century becomes understandable. Dolnoja writes, It is no wonder that in today's world the greatest humanitarian achievements coexist with the greatest violence. Western libertinism with Eastern totalitarianism, creative violence has its roots in a reaffirmation of the Gnostic structure of thought. The Gnostics do not deny to the world the attribute of order, but they interpret it as an abomination rather than a good. They do not say that the cosmos is disordered, but that it is governed by rigid and hostile order, by a tyrannical and cruel law. Their god is not just outside and beyond the world, but against the world, and this is where they break from Christianity. Moral rebellion reflects a metaphysical rebellion. Therefore, the Gnostic position leads to the obliteration of ethics as refusal to respect being and be faithful to objective norms. This may seem like a leap to go from Francis Bacon and Hegel to 20th century totalitarianism to John Lennon and our motley crew. But the thread that ties them together is this rejection of the given order of creation which leads to an internal inconsistency. Modernity leads not to the utopia John Lennon imagined, it necessarily leads to the dystopia created by history's other Lenin. Modernity envisions a transcendent future but can only get there through a violent negation of the past. In the name of this revolution, any and all atrocities are tolerated and even lauded as necessary to the revolutionary cause. This is not just an aberration of Leninism and Stalinism. Even the gentle and humane Gramsci wrote, Every act can be regarded as virtuous or wicked only in reference to its effect in helping or hindering the success of the revolutionary cause. In ancient thought, politics w was subordinated to ethics. With Machiavelli, politics and ethics developed as separate disciplines. In modernity, ethics is subordinated to politics. In this thought, religion and especially Christianity must be destroyed, or at least subordinated to the political order which becomes the vehicle for the violent revolution necessary for human transcendence into the future. Having reached this point, Del Noche can show why communism is doomed to fail. The revolution requires a complete negation of existing society. Thus, Marx arrives at the proletariat as the concrete historical mediator of the transition to the society of equals. But to do this, the proletariat requires self-awareness, which they cannot possess intrinsically because they cannot help being contaminated by the bourgeoisie thinking that dominates the culture. Therefore, the philosophers, the Marxists, who are not members of the proletariat but of the bourgeoisie, must act in the interests of the proletariat. And this shows how Del Noce is able to connect Marxism to Gnosticism. These intellectuals who possess a superior knowledge are effectively the new Gnostics, who in modern times have taken on the appearance of professional revolutionaries. And this can help us understand the problems of today. The proletariat had to be replaced with the party, then the dictatorship, and finally the technocratic class, which my viewers might know as the cathedral. Is not the cathedral the manifestation of philosopher kings of socialism using the instruments of the bourgeoisie society supposedly in an attempt to wake up the proletariat? And when the proletariat disagree with this ruling class, such as in the election of Trump or Brexit, which is the first accusation? that the working class is acting against its own best interest. The success of the revolution, therefore, requires the betrayal of the revolution. The proletariat are called liberated from the bourgeoisie only when they adopt the materialistic values and the secular culture of the same bourgeoisie. This is what Del Noce refers to as the heterogenesis of ends of Marxism. Essentially, modernity seeks to get rid of religion, the natural order, and authority for the sake of freedom, but in doing so lays the seeds for totalitarianism based only in power. 
As a side note, this also explains why third-wave political solutions like fascism and Nazism are doomed to fail. It opposes modernity, but only by granting the premise. It accepts the axiological character of modernity, but only reverses the causality. Thus, the communists can easily explain why fascism, as an antithesis to be overcome by the revolution, is doomed to fail. Fascism is merely a historical aberration caused by and adopted by those who with an underdeveloped psychosociality. It rejects the modern era, but it does not reject modernity. And therefore, it is merely, as Del Noche writes, a sin against the progressive movement of history, just as every sin boils down to a sin against the direction of history. I won't insult you by belaboring this point further, but I'll merely indicate to how this resembles Moldbug's analysis of the Whig theory of history. A true reaction against modernity must overturn the axiological significance of modernity. Dolnocha writes, in Nazism, everything develops as if the criterion of truth were to replace each communist category with its exact opposite, but still within the same materialistic perspective of Marxism. Thus, class is replaced by race, the bourgeoisie by the Jew. Hence, history is interpreted as a death struggle between the Aryan and the Jew, which has now reached the decisive stage when evil will be defeated or will triumph. Nazism and fascism can never eclipse Marxism because they accept Marxism's subordination of ethics to politics and economics. Christianity commands a higher ethical imperative than the revolution. Thus, modernism, both of the left-wing or right-wing variety, requires a denial of the metaphysical in order to justify its ends. Atheism is not a result of modernity, it is presupposed by it. But then, it seems modernism merely destroys itself. The Enlightenment was doomed to become Marxism or fascism, fascism was doomed to lose to Marxism, and Marxism was doomed to destroy itself. Why is this important for us in the West? Del Noche answers by discussing how the techno-bureaucratic class, known to us now as the cathedral, is sustained by a new totalitarianism that was only made possible in the wake of the decomposition of Marxism. In this new totalitarianism, Del Noche writes, the individual is extinguished and the idea of politics is subsumed within the idea of war, even in peacetime. This means that all forms of criticism must be prevented whenever they are addressed at real power, because instead of advancing rational arguments, supposedly they reflect or conceal the conservatism or reactionary spirit that are typical of a repressed psychology, regardless of the self-awareness of those who criticize. It becomes impossible to ask questions like, why should we trust the mainstream media and the universities, because no interlocutor will take that as a serious question. The answer will be, you are only asking that question because you're a reactionary, a fascist, or alt-right. Disagreement can only be a symptom of bad psychology. There are several aspects of this totalitarianism. The first, like in communism, is scientism. Del Noche writes, scientism neither sublates other forms of thought, nor tries to elevate them to a higher level, but simply negates them. At the same time, just like the supporters of every other form of totalitarianism, an advocate of scientism must think that the society he proposes will be legitimized by some future unverifiable outcome. His reasoning is strictly analogous to that of the communist. Just as a communist thinks that after the revolution, after the dictatorship of the proletariat, etc., mankind will enter an age of superhuman happiness, so does a believer in scientism. The only difference from a communist is that he contradicts himself, and what is worse, he does so hypocritically, inasmuch as he thinks that, because his philosophy asserts that only what can be verified by everybody is real, he is the true ideal champion of democracy. Thus, by accepting the guidance of science, we will march toward a full reconciliation of nature and civilization through a peaceful evolution. In this sense, scientism is an enemy of tradition, religion, and morality. By insisting that truth can only be scientific, all non-scientific truths are not only negated, but seen as reactionary and enemies of progress. This allows for an even greater exploitation of people by governments, corporations, and other economic powers. Dolnocha writes, In light of this, we understand why scientific anti-traditionalism can express itself only by dissolving the fatherlands where it was born. Because of the very nature of science, which provides means but does not determine any end, scientism lends itself to be used as a tool by some group. Which group? The answer is completely obvious. Once the fatherlands are gone, all that is left are the great economic organisms, which look more and more like fiefdoms. 
States become their executive instruments, confirming the old Marxist-Leninist thesis, but through a different route than that predicted by Marxism-Leninism. Marxism clears the ground for more ruthless capitalism by destroying the traditional elements of culture that restrain capitalism. In this way, Del Noche writes, Marxism is condemned to do capitalism's work. The second aspect is an erotization of our culture made possible by the denial of metaphysics. Once a society is no longer a shared community participating in the life of God, but a union of ego then the commercialization of the human body is inevitable. Modesty and chastity are viewed as sexual repression. Objections to the sexual revolution are dealt with by the revolutionaries just as objections to the Russian revolution were dealt with by those revolutionaries. Accusations of having a repressed sexuality or being an incel are a totalitarian way of negating the other, just as were accusations of Jewry in Nazi Germany or counter-revolutionary sympathies in Stalinist Russia. Dolnocha writes, Today it is modesty that, at best, is tolerated in people who are inhibited or cannot give up ancestral prejudices. Anybody who says, I am still attached to a certain type of traditional morality may expect to be excused because it is just an affirmation of fact, but woe to him if he claims that this fact should be recognized as a value. By now, being scandalized is condemned without appeal. Of course, there are not a few Catholics who regard this condemnation as a progress in charity. The demonic always creeps in by creating an opposition between certain truths and virtues that when they are separated become errors. In the case at hand, charity versus respect for the objective order of being. In his 1972 work, The Roots of the Crisis, Del Noche connected the tyrannies of scientism and eroticism. The remaining believers in a transcendent authority of values will be marginalized and reduced to second-class citizens. They will be imprisoned in moral concentration camps. At the end of the process is a spiritual version of genocide. The individual will be denied the right to his environment, to his tradition, to modesty, indeed the total liberalization of passions as the pinnacle of the permissive society coincides with the annihilation of modesty. Thus, the subordination of spiritual transcendence to material transcendence that John Lennon, Big Joel, Sargon of Akkad, and even Ben Shapiro to some degree share in common is the same ideology that forms the synopsis of the cathedral. By trying to deny man's dependence on God in the name of progress, scientism and eroticism have made us slaves to our own base desires for pleasure and power, and the consequences thereof. As G.K. Chesterton once said, when you remove the supernatural, you don't get the natural, you get the unnatural. By denying heaven, you don't get peace, you get the Russian Revolution. By denying the natural order, you don't get well-adjusted individuals living for today, you get sexual confusion. By denying authority, you don't get the brotherhood of man, you get the tyranny of the corporations, bureaucrats, and the mainstream media. Now, what can we do about all this? Well, that's a topic for another video. Thanks for watching. I know this video was a long time coming, but it touched on a lot of things I wanted to talk about. What do you think? What are your thoughts on all this? Leave a comment telling me what you agree with and what you don't, and why. Links to relevant stuff are in the description. Until next time, I'm Benedict the 17th. Go with God.